Okay, so continuing the lecture on learning and memory, let's talk about amnesia and the special case in which um, amnesia is the result of hippocampal damage, hippocampal damage, damage to the hippocampus. This brain right here is the brain of someone famous who had damage to his hippocampus, and that's patient HM. So HM had surgery um, to remove his temporal lobes bilaterally and to relieve epilepsy. And as a result, he had severe enterograde amnesia. Um, so enterograde amnesia is the inability to form new long-term memories, new long-term memories. So there's also um, retrograde amnesia, which is where um, previously formed long-term memories are lost, but this is the inability to form new long-term memories. So short-term and working memory in patient HM was actually still intact, okay? So the hippocampus is not where short-term memories are formed um, or stored. Um, that memory was um, intact, okay? So he could still remember things for a few minutes. He could still talk to you. Um, he could remember your name for a brief conversation. Um, but then later in the day, if you were to come back and um, after introducing yourself, um, he would act as if um, he didn't know you. Long-term explicit memory. If you're talking about long-term memories before the surgery, that was also intact. So HM can remember his childhood um, memories that happened before his surgery. However, after the surgery, long-term memories were virtually gone. Okay? Long-term explicit memories. Um, memories that he could consciously report. Okay. Um, semantic memories, um, forming new semantic memories was weak. It wasn't totally gone. Um, learning new labels for abstract images or um, new factual information. Um, <clears throat> episodic memories, the ability to form new episodic memories was gone. That's um, type of memory that's a, that the hippocampus is especially involved in. Implicit memory, um, still some impairment here, but, but better than ex explicit. Procedural memory specifically appeared to be intact, so he was able to um, learn new procedural tasks, um, like some complex, um, some motor tasks. His, his performance was able to improve on those, even, if, even though he had <clears throat> no explicit memory of performing the task at all. Here is a link to a YouTube video that I'll also post, um, that I'll post in the description for this one. Um, and this is a video depicting um, patient EP, a more modern day example of this anterograde amnesia due to hippocampal damage. Hip, um, EP um, had a virus that damaged his hippocampi. You can see how this is manifest um, in that case. Uh, this is just an FYI, uh, but the Nobel Prize um, recently, I think it was 2016, uh, was given to Edvard and Maybritt Moser, some Danish scientists, um, as well as one other scientist, I can't remember his name. Um, but they studied what are called place cells and grid cells. So these are cells in the hippocampus and nearby cortex. And they appear to play a special role in spatial navigation. So a place cell is a cell in the hippocampus that will fire only when an animal is in a certain place, like in a, in a maze or in an, in an open field. And they'll be silent unless the rat is in that particular spot. Um, these studies have been done in, in rats. Grid cells um, are what you see here. So um, the more dor dorsal aspects of the re a region called the entorhinal cortex, which is close to the hippocampus, um, 
a cell is going to fire when the rat is in these different areas, um, which forms a grid. If you take this data and make kind of this heat map here, um, you can see it'll fire when it's here, and then when it's here, here, it'll be silent in the gaps in between. And you can see these form these nice equilateral triangles um, that form this grid, and the, the grid gets wider and you kind of zoom in as you go more ventral. And when you get to the hippocampus, then it's just there's just one <laughs> point um, at which the cells fire. Here you can see at this video, you can see some recordings from a few place cells in a rat's brain as it navigates a maze. Um, some really cool new um, data on a um, uh, function of the hippocampus in forming spatial memories, um, like the memory of where you parked your car, um, and um, helping us to navigate our environments. This is just another FYI, um, a quick study I wanted to, to highlight, um, and really a, um, a concept uh, called reconsolidation, which we don't have time to discuss in depth. When we talked about consolidation, reconsolidation is where memories can be manipulated, um, erased, uh, kind of reformed. So this is data from Saladin et al. Um, I'll, uh, I'll put a citation in the, uh, um, in the description as well if you want to look up this study. Um, but this is, these are the number of cigarettes smoked per day. You can see there are these two groups. Um, one um, so before a treatment, um, you have um, a certain baseline number, and then after treatment, you have some reduction. And this yellow group especially uh, has reduced their smoking a significantly greater amount. Now, this may seem pretty small, but getting a smoker to reduce their smoking is, um, is not trivial. And the uh, the only difference between these two condition, conditions is actually just one five minute video that um, the participants watched. So there is a therapy um, known as exposure therapy. Uh, it's used in um, treating OCD, post traumatic stress disorder, um, and it's been explored for addiction as well. The idea behind it is exposing smokers to cues that are associated with smoking without giving them the opportunity to smoke helps to break the association between those cues and the, the nicotine hit, you know, the, the, the actual dose of nicotine that's received that provides that reinforcement. So both of these participants watched some videos of um, people smoking, um, cigarettes being lit, uh, things like that, just uh, cues associated with smoking the differences between between these two groups is prior to watching all those videos, one group watched a little five minute video um, just before, and the other watched a, a neutral video of just people mopping floors, um, or a video of people smoking. So there was kind of a brief um, um, cue before you know a, a bunch of cues were presented, whereas the other one just had a bunch of cues presented over and over again. Now that seems like that shouldn't make any difference, but the uh, that initial showing of that cue, um, what's believed to happen is that when you bring a memory online, when you re retrieve a memory, it kind of enters this state in which it can be manipulated, a labile state, a state in which it's vulnerable to manipulation again. And if that is then followed by you know a bunch of exposure that would normally be associated uh, exposure to cues that would normally be associated with smoking and instead is associated with nothing then that memory can get reconsolidated but it, it requires it first to be retrieved so anyway that that was a, a fascinating study I thought that was actually done at MUSC where I did my uh, my PhD um, so Anyway, look up reconsolidation if that's something that is interesting to you. It won't be on the exam, but um, 
but a really fascinating um, phenomenon. It's being used in other treating other disorders as well. Um, and there, there are other ways that you can disrupt um, the reformation of that memory um, by uh, chemical means as well, uh, pharmacological interventions. So, all right, that's all.